Hello, everybody. I would like to share with you today a video by Mr. Craig Murray, who used to be a British ambassador and worked in the Foreign Office for many, many years in the um, upper echelons. And he put out uh, about uh, in the beginning of April a video in which he explains what the impact of Israel's actions at the moment is uh, not only on international relations, but international law, and what kind of dire state this leaves us in. I will give some additional analysis about what he said uh, after the video, but here's about 12-13 minutes of his video and his analysis of what's currently going on. Hello, I am Craig Murray. I wanted to talk to you urgently because I'm, I'm really worried that we are seeing the collapse of the fabric of international law and even the abandonment of the idea of Western democracy. I was worried that the world was getting hardened, getting inured to the genocide in, in, in Gaza. I myself found I wasn't crying so much in, in October, November, December, when I, I saw pictures of dead babies, when I saw a small child burying an even smaller child, a, a brother carrying the body of his little sister, children crying over the corpse of their dead mother. I, I used to cry regularly. Um, I don't do it so much now. I don't cry so much because I've seen so much of it. And I was worrying myself, you know, am I, am I getting hardened? And there seemed less outrage in the world. The massacre at Al-Shifa Hospital that's taken place this last few days seems to have touched a nerve again in the world, certainly on social media. And it's just astonishing. It, it, it's incredible. You have doctors and surgeons executed. One lady doctor and her son, a surgeon, both killed. Many bodies found with their arms and legs tied together. Even children executed, children shot in close range. Hundreds of people dead. And then a hospital destroyed, burnt down, blown up, all the medical equipment deliberately destroyed. I, I've seen video of a child ha having its life support equipment turned off and being tipped onto the floor to die by IDF soldiers who themselves posted a video. And remember, back when this all started, the Israelis first bombed Al Shifa Hospital, they claimed it couldn't possibly be true. They would never bomb a hospital, and, and it was a Hamas misfire, even though the explosion was hundreds of times more powerful than anything Hamas had ever had. Their missiles don't have explosive warheads, they're just fireworks, basically. And it, we, Israel has now destroyed over 30 hospitals in Gaza. It's not the first time Israel's been into Al Shifa. Previously, it had wiped out large parts of the hospital, and it certainly disarmed anybody in there. Remember, it found those um, few guns and uh, uh, in, in, in knapsacks, everyone was rather dubious about four or five guns got in there. But they knew for certain <laughs> that there, there wasn't a large-scale armed force in there because they cleaned it out twice before already and been surrounding it ever since. How could there be? It's just massacre. Everyone knows it's massacre. Everyone knows it's genocide. And this comes days after, just days after, the International Court of Justice issued a second uh, order of provisional measures, specifically ordering a ceasefire. Everyone knows this is a genocide. There's nobody in the world who doesn't know this is a genocide. There's some Zionists who support the genocide, who choose to deny it because that's politically useful, 
but of course they know it's a genocide, they just support it. Everyone knows Israel is in, in breach of international humanitarian law. You, you see a dozen videos a day on, 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 on Twitter or YouTube showing breaches of international humanitarian law, the pretense that it isn't by the UK, Germany, uh, the European Union, United States, is pathetic. You know, it's just an obvious lie. And it's planned. I used to be in government. I was a British ambassador. I was a member of the senior management structure of the British Foreign Office for six years. A decision like the decision to cut funding to UNRWA can't be taken in a few hours, not in any country. In the UK, that would take at least a week of, of, of planning. There'd be submissions written to ministers. Other ministries with an interest have to be consulted. Um, and there'd be meetings. Can't do it in a few hours. And after Israel uh, you know, produced these allegations, for which there is no evidence whatsoever of uh, UNRWA involvement with, with Hamas, on the day the International Court of Judgment uh, finding of plausible genocide came out, that very afternoon, uh, all the Western nations, most of the Western nations, cut funding to UNRWA to help kickstart the starvation policy. And that was planned. You know, that was coordinated and timed. It would have taken at least a week to plan that, to do all the coordination between all the different countries, to, to get it agreed through the, the ministries and, and government mechanisms of the different countries. That was a planned response to the ICJ report. These Western countries have been planning this genocide for months, if not years. And this coordinated line that Israel is not breaching international humanitarian law, when it plainly is, and when the latest ICJ ruling was unanimous, 15 to nil, ordering a complete ceasefire, which is responded to with the Al Shiva massacre and with yet more, more bombings. And it's not just that this is this is destroying the fabric of international law. It, it's making a mockery of the Security Council. It's making a mockery of the International Court of Justice. But the whole fabric of post-1946 international law, I know many of you are sceptical about international law, but in fact it had many great achievements, the International Court of Justice. Uh, dozens and dozens of, of rulings which have been respected. The UN has had success with peacekeeping forces and conflict resolution. All that is now abandoned, completely abandoned by uh, the Western powers uh, in order to promote the Zionist project. But that's not all that's abandoned. Democracy is abandoned. There's no Western country except perhaps Germany with, with their Holocaust guilt, but there's there's no Western country where the people do not want this stopped, do want, not want an end to this genocide, and where people can't see it's genocide. But in almost every country in the West, both the government and the main opposition party supports the genocide. That's certainly true in the United Kingdom, it's true in the United States, it's true in Germany, it's true in France. We have a political class which is supporting genocide. And that's to do with the fact that we have a political class which isn't responsive to the people at all, doesn't care what the people think. The political class is entirely in the pocket of billionaires. And our so-called democracy in most of our countries is a choice between voting for a government of one bunch of neoconservative, so genocidal Zionists, or voting for a different colour of neoconservative, pro genocidal Zionists. And the contempt for the will of the people and the contempt for the notion of democracy and the sense of impunity of the political class, who are all complicit in genocide, 
the fact that they had the corrupt International Criminal Court, which is different from the International Court of Justice, but they had the corrupt International Criminal Court and its corrupt prosecutors in their pocket. The system has broken down. All of us today are upset, are, are raging about this genocide, and there's nothing we can do. There's no way at the moment we can influence our countries, which are supplying weapons, which are supplying intelligence, which are flying aerial surveillance uh, to assist the Israelis, uh, which are giving logistical support to the Israelis. And we can't stop them because our political systems are rotten. There is no leverage. The bond between the people and the political class is completely broken. They don't care about the people. They only care about the, the billionaires who are in charge of them and in charge of the media. And the media narratives we have seen, the difference between the truth that everybody in the world almost can see on their mobile phones about what's actually happening and the rubbish propaganda that the media is pumping out. Again, the, there's this total disconnect between reality and the socio-political system that we all live in. For me, it's a terrible warning. This dreadful, appalling, un unbelievable thing that's happening to the Palestinian people. And our problem that we can't stop it. We have no levers to stop it. As a people, we have no levers to stop it. As ordinary citizens, there seems so little we can do. It's actually just a symptom of fact there's nothing we can do to control our own lives either. There's nothing we can do to stop the massive and ever-growing gap between rich and poor. Stop the fact that the world is heading for its first trillion years. First trillion years. While even in developed countries, people are sleeping on the streets and children live in poverty and education systems are collapsing. This is a terrible time for the world. What can be done? What should be done? Well, for now, let me just concentrate on Israel. And what needs to be done is a Security Council resolution under Chapter 7, which mandates action. That needs to mandate a ceasefire, mandate a no-fly zone, and it needs to mandate military forces to enforce it. And the mandate should be given to China and to South Africa with others who wish to join them to lead a force uh, to militarily put an end to this genocide. It's time that China stood up and took on responsibilities that come with being the world's economic power, and it has the military power to do it if it has the will. And we need to see that kind of Chapter 7 resolution introduced at the United Nations. And if the United States and the United Kingdom keep vetoing it, as I'm sure they will, um, that will only show still further the gap between the people and the political class and may eventually be part of what leads us on to action. I'm sorry, I wish I could sound more hopeful. Uh, I, I, I think all of us today feel, feel a blackness of despair of what's happening in Gaza. We must all, all of us, take every single political action within our power to try to end it. Thank you very much. What Mr. Murray said in this video is very important because we must not underestimate how fragile international law itself is because it doesn't stand on any really enforceable top-down governmental structure the way that you and I, we live in, in countries where the police and the judicial forces and so on are, are able to impose a structure on us and therefore we behave. In the international realm, international law works in a very different way because we do not have a central power on top of us that then, that then makes us 
behave in a, in a certain way, that can force us to behave. In the international sphere, it is very much anarchy un unless countries decide to actually abide by certain rules. And the rules of international law are the ones we have now are four or five hundred years old. Of course, they're built on even older uh, on all the structures, but what we currently have and what we what we call international law is about 400 years old, and what we what is called humanitarian law, which really is the law of war, is about 200 years old, and and human rights law is about 80 years old, and all of what we have created through a lot of treaties, the Geneva Convention, the Vienna Convention, and so on. This is built on the idea that states under any circumstances are, are supposed to keep to these rules because they're good for all of us. Now, if states depart from that, and if they, if they break even most fundamental norms, like the sanctity of of uh, embassies, then this can have a ripple effect, and we saw that. Uh, a day or two after Israel bombed the uh, the the uh, embassy, Iran's embassy in Syria, and killed uh, Iranians inside inside the embassy, which is a clear breach of the Vienna Convention. It's one of the worst breaches of the Vienna Convention you can you can imagine. Uh, only a few days later, then uh, Mexico, Ecuador. Uh, raided the embassy of, uh, of of Ecuador in order to get out a um, an, an, a politician that they that they were looking for, and this is this is one of the things you cannot do, uh, not because it's impossible. It is very much possible, but because these conventions are so important. Uh, this is the basic fabric, the trust between nations, that they will keep to certain minimal standards. The same way that if, when uh, Israel is indiscriminately bombing and killing civilians, that is a huge breach of the Geneva Conventions and so on. And if this catches on, then we lose international law. We you, you lose international humanitarian law. We, you, we lose the idea that there are constraints on what states can and uh, can do. And that will be to the detriment of all of us. And the, it's not just Israel. The fact that the West itself, as Mr. Murray correctly pointed out, is complicit in all of these actions and is complicit in undermining international law. Also, also by matters of how they speak about it, that they speak about rules-based order instead of international law. All of this undermines 400 years of evolution of a body of law that has been created that has normative force because people believe in it, because a large number of people say that this is how the international world should be governed. It's not a question of being um, an idealist or something. If enough people believe that the Vienna Conventions and the Geneva Conventions are actual law, then they have force. And if counterexamples come in and, and states breach the laws with impunity time and again, into the face of the rest of the international community, well, then the international community is not going to care about that very much anymore. You know, and that's really the danger that we are seeing here at the moment in, in an unprecedented scale, especially things like breaching the Vienna Conventions on the sanctity of, of embassies. Uh, th this will have horrible negative consequences if it continues. And we must make clear internationally like and all of us as well that we want these rules to be there and that we are not okay with this being being accepted also by our our individual countries we need to criticize israel and it is needs to be official criticism and official condemnation that you cannot breach the v the vienna conventions that is not okay you cannot breach the, the geneva convention it is not okay and even if we cannot get um cases going on, on an international scale, it would make sense to use national courts in order to, to prosecute as far as possible um, crimes or people, criminals, who are, who are comp complicit in such actions. If we, don't, if we don't manage to protect the norms that protect all of us, well, all of us are going to lose out in it. And the, what the Palestinians are suffering today, this might be what each one of us has to suffer in the near future if we don't manage to, to stifle off this threat to international law.